What is up guys, welcome back to the channel. Today's reaction video is a long one. Yes. We're going to be doing it in two parts. So this is part one and part two will be out in about three hours after this one goes live. We're back with a bang. We are doing the Fire Electrician. It's been a while since we've done Fire Electrician. Yeah. We are doing America's Legendary Marine Sniper, Carlos White Feather Halfcock. Halfcock? I think that's it, isn't it? Um, so we're going to do this in 40 minutes, 40 minutes in the next one. Or if Archie wakes up and interrupts after 35, we'll do it that way. But this will be part one. We're not going to be pausing. We are going to be talking over this video. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we won't be talking over it. Well, it'll be when we can. We'll be a little bit louder so you'll hear us. If you want to watch this whole thing interrupted, the yeah, links. Uninterrupted. Did I say interrupted? Oh, I'm having a nightmare tonight. Um, uninterrupted, the link is in the description. But please, enjoy this reaction. Uh, it'll be like our movie reactions. And uh, are you ready? Yeah. Smash that like button, guys. Smash that subscribe button. If you guys want to see more of this, we'll do it. But it does take up a lot of time, these videos. So we want to see ratings, if that's okay. So please, if you do enjoy it, smash mm -hmm. that like button and subscribe button. Fire Electrician, go and check him out. Awesome channel. Are you ready? I'm ready. For one marathon. By the way, Kenny... Everyone knows Kenny on the channel, on the live stream and stuff like that. I was chatting to him and he said, he didn't want to give any spoilers from it. And he said he knew about this story and he, like, he knew about the person. And he said, that electrician did him justice and it's a must watch video, wow. is what he said. So high praise for Matt. I'm looking forward to it. Let's go. This is my fifth attempt at making this video in the past two years. Oh, Portions wow. of this story have been told and retold across books, newspaper articles, and the internet for decades. And with every retelling, more and more doubt gets cast upon this story's validity because the events seem that unbelievable. Okay. And because of that, I felt that it was very important to not only be able to tell this story in its entirety, but to be able to prove that it was not only plausible, but probable along the way. That oh, being said, it's gonna be in detail. I've been waiting two years to say this next part. Quiet. Today we're talking about the greatest <laughs> sniper of all time, ladies and gentlemen, Carlos Norman Hathcock II, or as the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong came to call him, Long Tang, aka White Feather. Okay, Long Tang. Wait, wait, tang. we gotta get the sponsorship in, then we can have the rest of the story uninterrupted. This video is brought <laughs> to you by Rich Wallet. Okay, look, here's the deal. They've sponsored the channel before. You guys already Bible sized debt. And two, they're gonna be giving thousand dollars a day, which one I would penality. Entry regardless of the four times of the description. Jamie, comment down below. Let's get back to the video. January 20th, 1942, Carlos Hathcock Jr. is born in Little Rock, Arkansas. Fast forward to early 1946, Carlos is approximately three years old and his father has just returned home from fighting in World War II. And okay. with him, Carlos Hathcock Sr. brought home the family a gift for his adorable baby boy, a German Mauser, which if you don't know, is the primary infantry weapon of the Nazis in World War II. Oh, Apparently wow. he had tactically acquired it after its previous owner nice had baby toy. died <laughs> suddenly. Yep, that's exactly what happened. So, you know, presumably, after rolling Thank up you. and just seeing the rifle laying on the ground, he did what any American would do. He picked it up, he kind of admired it, and was like, huh, this would make a great gift for my toddler. So he plugged the barrel, he made <laughs> it inoperable, at least, and then brought it back home and gave it to his kid. So now Dad's home, and we've got young we know old Carlos in. Hathcock running around in the woods outside of Little Rock, Arkansas, with a de-weaponized German Mauser pretending that he's fighting Nazis and the Imperial Japanese, just like Dad. Fast forward again to when Carlos is seven years old, and he sees his first John Wayne movie, where John Wayne is portraying a United States Marine. At this moment, Carlos Hathcock decides that he is going to be a Marine, too. Everything Seems else in blue, life, think. school, yeah. chores, all of it, is just biding time until he turns 17 years old, he can get his parents' permission to go and join the Marine Corps. One year after that, Carlos's father re-enters the military to go fight in the Korean War, and the family is moved to Missouri, then they're moved to Tennessee. The father goes off, he fights, he comes back home, but when he comes back home, both of his parents have, they've always kind of had a drinking problem, but their drinking gets significantly worse, and so does their relationship. The next major oh, formative event in Carlos's shame. life is at his 10th birthday when he is given his very first real gun, a JC Higgins bolt action 22 caliber rifle. From that point 10, on, Carlos wow. basically lives out in the woods shooting cans, it's squirrels, birds, to... anything yeah. he can. And while Carlos is out in the woods, his parents' relationship continues to deteriorate. And by the time that he is 12, his parents have gotten a divorce and Carlos is sent back to Arkansas 
to live with his grandmother in an unincorporated village known as Geyer. Unincorporated oh, no, I, I, village basically I, 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 just I, I, I was thinking like with one parent. Yeah. Carlos's next oldest sibling is 10 years younger than him. There's no neighbor kids anywhere near his age for a 20 mile radius and grandma and grandpa are busy doing grandma and grandpa stuff. So Carlos spends the majority of his teenage years basically living out in the woods with his dog and his 22 caliber rifle, helping to put food on the family table because grandma and grandpa are struggling financially. So they okay. are eating squirrels, birds, and wow. rabbits, whatever Carlos is able That's to shoot. Tough. During this time, oh, Carlos yeah. becomes an exceptional outdoorsman. His 22 caliber rifle does not have a very huge range. And if he wants to be able to kill something efficiently, he needs to be able to get as close as possible. He learns how to move through the woods quietly, sneaking up on highly alert prey. And he becomes such an exceptional marksman that he's able to shoot birds out of the air while they are flying Ooh. with his 22 caliber rifle, That's which impressive. is impressive. Wow. And this goes on for years. And then at the age of 15, Carlos drops out of school and goes to work full time doing concrete. He does that for two more years till he finally hits the age of 17. He then gets consent from his guardian to go and join the Marine Corps. Okay. So in 1959, okay. at the age of 17, Carlos Hathcock goes off to training to become a Marine, and he absolutely crushes it. I mean, how could he not? He's been doing full-time <laughs> manual labor for a couple of years, and the yeah, 10 years life, yeah, that, he's basically been living in the woods by himself, learning how to become an expert marksman. Despite being the best shot out of any new recruit available, he continues to hone this skill. They have a mandatory amount of time and qualifications they have to meet in marksmanship. However, okay. Carlos Hathcock also also spends all of his free time out at the range, continuing to work on this skill Daddy when Kagan. nobody yeah. else does. He doesn't just want to be a good shot, he wants to be the best shot, and he wants to be able to do it from every single position the Marine Corps utilizes at the time. They do standing, prone, sitting, kneeling, and they have the infamous squat position at this point in time, mm -hmm. also commonly oh. referred to as the rice paddy prone. So how they do that get practices Impressive. all of them and masters all of them. It is at this point that Hathcock begins to develop what he calls his bubble, which is essentially his aura of concentration around taking a shot, where nothing in the world gets any attention other than his target and his crosshairs. Makes sense. One of his instructors once said, and I quote, an elephant could crap on Hathcock's head and unless the load blocked the sights, Carlos would never even notice. Wow. So Carlos That's is impressive. already just naturally immensely talented at marksmanship, but he's also completely obsessed with getting better. That's all this guy cares about. And it just reminds me of something one of my coaches used to say, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And I probably True. heard this coach mm -hmm. say Big that 50 one. times over the course of a couple of years. And then finally, we had this new guy that raised his hand and said, but coach, what if talent does work hard? To which my coach replied, you should probably stay out of that motherfucker's way. And yeah, in the case screwed. of Carlos Hathcock, that would prove to be correct. Carlos finishes training, gets MOS qualified as an 0331, a machine gunner, and then immediately gets sent over to Hawaii and stationed there because that's where the Marine Corps rifle team is. So okay. Carlos goes over to Hawaii, reports for his new duty station, gets settled, gets signed up for every marksmanship no, competition they have mm -hmm. scheduled, shows up to the very first one. It's a 600 yard event. Now Carlos is here because he's a great shot, but he's also the new guy. He just got out of training. All the big dogs are here. This is where the Marine Corps rifle team is at. Like he's not expected to do well in these competitions at all he is the newbie that yeah, they need I'm to take okay. under their wing and train and he's the next generation of shooter and this is going to be his first competition just to get his feet wet is what everybody thinks is going to happen and then carlos wins the entire fucking thing oh, pretty oh. much immediately after winning this competition he is given an official spot on the marine corps rifle team meaning that this is more or less his full-time job now like yes he's a machine gunner but his day-to-day -day job is going to be going and improving his marksmanship to be able to show off how great the marksmanship of the marine corps is which okay. is great for uh -huh. carlos it's basically his dream job and on top of that it's 1960 it's a time of peace there's no prospects for war on the horizon and there's really nothing else for a machine gunner to be doing so the Wait, rifle yeah. team is a great spot for him carlos spends the next two years there continuing to hone his skills winning all kinds of competitions and one of the people that he meets there that's also on the rifle team is a lieutenant by the name of jim land and jim land has this dream that he wants to bring back sniper school and make it a permanent fixture in the united states marine corps okay I was going to say, well, I know what a sniper is. I was going to say, what is sniper school? Like, I'm guessing. Just basically, they learn, like, everything. people get trained sniper. And this is going to, yeah. when he becomes an insane sniper. Yeah. I don't know when the next conflict is. I'm, I'm trying to do the dates in my head. I can't really think what conflict he's going to be in. But if they think, did they say Vietnam? Was, did they say Vietnam at the start? I think he did. Vietnam Dad war. Came back from Vietnam, no. Oh, I can't remember. No, because he said about they called him. Like, what did he say the Vietnamese called him? Oh, yeah, they called him the White Feather. I can't remember. I'm ready for this. Yeah. It seems like he's 
it just succeeds at everything. It's a big true thing though, isn't it? That if you put the work in, you're yeah, it's not talent. all talent. Yeah, like, exactly. You can be talented at something if you work for put it. Put your work in. Whatever you want to do in life, go for it, guys. Like I said, we won't be pausing you know much. Like, every so often. Some people are born talented. talented. Oh, one hundred percent. You can be talented just by making yourself talented. Exactly, but you can beat talent by Trust working me, hard. Trust me, I'm talented at watching new standards. Yeah, well, James yeah. would agree. Way too. Tired I went born watching East Enders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if Way you don't know, too. in 1960, there's no snipers in the U.S. military. That's not a thing. Most people don't even know what that is or have oh, ever really? heard of it. Now, I can't speak wow. for other countries, but in America, there always appears to be this desire from the higher ups in the chain of command to try to get rid of the scout snipers altogether, right? We had okay. scout snipers during World War II. Right after World War II, they got rid of the school, got rid of the job, them. didn't exist anymore. Korean War broke out bring them back. Korean War ends. Get rid of them. And in my opinion, this is due to the simple fact that the role of the scout sniper both terrifies and makes the chain of command look dumb all at the same time. Because in modern times, how are all the high-ranking generals that are going to conveniently have a nice, cushy, multi-million dollar a year job at a DOD contractor going to be able to justify using an $800,000 Hellfire missile to take out one bad guy when they've got some fucking 20-year-old corn-fed <laughs> kid from Omaha named Lance Corporal Smith that's willing to crawl on his belly for three days and shoot that same guy in the face from 500 yards away with a bullet that costs 68 cents. So the first True. thing the scout okay. snipers have going against them is that they're just too efficient, right? I mean, it's too hard efficient. to make billions and billions of dollars off of warfare when you've got these guys out there unaliving people off the dollar menu. You guys are getting paid? Back in the day, the reason for getting rid of sniper wow. school after World War II and Korea was pretty much the same thing. It wasn't a gentlemanly, noble, honorable way of conducting warfare it seems kind of cowardly to dress up like a bush and it's shoot your enemy bro. when he mm -hmm. can't even see you which is exactly the type of wannabe tough guy bullshit that somebody not putting their ass on the line would say True. it's probably more along the lines of the high-ranking officer realizes like well if I utilize snipers, my snipers are going to go shoot at their high-ranking officers because obviously that's the whole point. But then the enemy is probably going to train snipers and then their snipers are going to come shoot me. If he's going to come in here, he's going to kick my ass. The entire concept is just stupid and un-American, right? America didn't win its independence from Great Britain because we marched our happy asses out into an open field and stood there while they shot at us. Fuck you, we're shooting at your ass from the tree line. Yeah, Get off our the lawn. Small the unofficial mm -hmm. slogan of the United States military is if you're not cheating, you're not not trying for a reason okay you go to any grunt in any branch in the united states military and you give them the option of like hey if you fight like this we'll write he died like a gentleman on your tombstone and if you fight like this you get to go home to your kids. Guess which one he's fucking picking. So if you're not picking up to put down, the long and short of it is basically snipers don't exist in 1960 because we allow people that don't have to do the job have an opinion on how the job needs to be done. That's there you go. But Jim Land has been studying up on this. He's been reading the old manuals that he could find. He's been talking to some of the older guys and he's like, this sniping thing sounds like it's pretty fucking important. Somebody should figure this out and preserve it because one day we might need it. So he okay. figures out everything he can about it, gets all the information. He writes up a proposal to the chain of command that he wants to have the very first scout sniper school. It's two weeks long and he's going to teach it here in Hawaii. Oh, wow. And the chain of that command night. is like, I mean, you guys are the rifle team. All you do is go shoot guns all day anyways. If you want to do it while crawling around in the bushes. Fucking go for it. I don't care. Get out of my office. So now, with permission, Jim Land is going to take volunteers, the first of which is Carlos Hathcock, and they're going to go out school. into the jungles in Hawaii yeah. and figure out how to become snipers. Starting from scratch, this is going to be the first iteration of the now legendary Marine Corps Scout Sniper Program. So they oh, go out okay. for two weeks, they train, they lay the groundwork for the Marine Corps Scout Sniper Program. Obviously, Carlos Hathcock excels because he's an expert woodsman. He knows how to move and traverse terrain mm. and be quiet the entire time and then after the two weeks is over that's pretty much it jim land keeps teaching the course but carlos hathcock is done he was just a student he's going to go back to the shooting team more or less he just got a pat on the back and add a boy and then a certificate that said that he was a scout sniper now but the certificate doesn't really mean a whole lot because nobody knows what the fuck a scout sniper true. even is so Very carlos true. just kind of chalks it up to a cool life experience that he's thankful for but he goes back to doing his competitive shooting in hawaii that goes on for another year that's like, like um, when i tell you what i do at work does it mean anything because you're just kind of like yeah, cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no offense. I feel like just whoosh. even at your old job, everyone you say to me, "What does James do for work?" and I'll be like, "Don't know." <laughs> you just sure. tell me. <laughs> I'm not sure. In 62, he's getting moved over to North Carolina to a place called Cherry Point, which is weird 
because that's a Marine Corps air base and he's technically an infantryman as a machine gunner 0331 so they're not even going to have any work for him there regardless he's got to go because he's got orders so he moves to North Carolina he shows up to the Cherry Point Air Base reports to the commander's office and the commander's like okay son I'm just gonna level with you I don't have a use for a machine gunner I don't even know how you ended he's up here like, how would you feel about just being like general staff which basically translates to he's going to be the groundskeeper he's going to be mowing the lawn scrubbing Ooh, the toilets I don't think maintaining like the yeah. bases facilities which to carlos hathcock is an absolute nightmare he does not want to spend the next three to five years of his career being a glorified janitor for this air base he feels like he has just been punched directly in the gut the minute those words left the commander's mouth yeah the yeah. commander seeing this look of horror on hathcock's face starts laughing he's like son relax your buddy jim land called me he made sure that you came to this air base because we have <laughs> okay. one of the best shooting teams in the country and you're going to be competing for us now oh you well, son okay. of a bitch I like the joke, George though. Carlos, like huge <laughs> relief. He gets to just continue shooting and training people how to shoot all day, every day. It's his passion in life. It's the perfect job for him. He gets to keep living the dream. But here's the thing. At this point in time, Carlos Hathcock is a private. And as a private, he's living in the barracks with a bunch of other Marines. And all the other Marines start to notice that Carlos is, he's a little bit different. Carlos isn't just into his job and enjoys shooting. This man is obsessed with shooting. Yeah. He stays out at the He's range every night yeah. until it's too dark to keep shooting. And then he comes back to the barracks. He'll drink and smoke like a normal Marine, but he's not going out chasing women. He's not going to the bars. He's staying at the barracks with his rifle next to his bunk, practicing dry firing from all of the wow. firing positions. And just to be oh, clear, wow. he's doing this for hours on end on a concrete wow. floor, okay? Some of these firing positions, like the prone position or the rice paddy squat, are not yeah. fun to hold. And this guy is doing it for hours every single night. He's basically practicing death yoga while he's smoking and drinking. It's the most Marine Corps shit I've ever heard in my Wait, entire life. It. So after witnessing this go on every single day for months, the rest of the Marines in the barracks are like, okay, okay, we got to get this guy laid. From now on, your dick <laughs> is my dick. I'm getting you some pussy. So one of the Marines is a girl to tell her at the local bank, and there's another really? girl at this very same bank that's single. So they manage to set Carlos Hathcock up on a blind date. He shows up to the bank, introduces himself. Hi, I'm Carlos Hathcock. Her name is Josephine. They go out on a date. They both fall in love immediately because Carlos Hathcock doesn't miss. Very next day, he's out <laughs> at the range all day. He's training people, getting training that's in. Fine. That's his job. The normal working day comes to an end, and Carlos does not stay on the range until sunset like he has every other day. Oh. No, Private Hathcock goes into town and buys a brand new car because he has to keep impressing Joe and he needs yeah, a car the girls to him. which is the most private in the military yeah, ship I've ever heard in my entire life. Every single private finishes training, goes to their unit, and then goes and buys a brand new V6 Mustang or Camaro to impress women. And he spends absolutely all of his money on this car. The only thing he has left in his budget is enough money to keep getting his hair cut, which he absolutely has to do anyways. But you know what? It was worth it because Carlos and Josephine ended up getting married oh, they moved in with one another and now well now josephine's the one that has to sit there and watch carlos do dry firing drills on the living room floor every single night before bed i mean she loved him for who he was mm. but a bit of a distraction bit of a obviously, distraction, oh, yeah. Yeah, obviously gonna interrupt it a little bit but i'm guessing not too much yeah he's put enough hours in hasn't he yeah <laughs> what the hell are you out of your fucking mind relax lois i was aiming for the mailbox i'm just trying to make a point Good morning, Lois. And this goes on for years. In 1962, he ends up setting a record for the Marine Corps Long Range A course, scoring 248 Ooh. out of 250 possible shots. A Not record bad. that to mm. this day has never been broken. Oh, in the wow. fall of 1965, wow. he would win silver in a national match competition. Even with the which technology is nowadays. He would also be recognized as a distinguished marksman, which is essentially being granted the rank of Jedi as far as competition shooting goes. And then that very same year, he would win the Wimbledon Cup. Wait, what? wait, 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 wait. Like, the actual Wimbledon... Wimbledon? I've never been known it being called the Wimbledon Cup, so... I don't know. But does he mean the Grand Sam Wimbledon, like Wimbledon in England? I'm guessing he does. That's incredible if he did. Yeah, I'm, I'm not guessing sure, he, Well, if he's saying he did, and it is that Wimbledon, it must be easy to verify because it'll be in records easily, yeah. you know? That's, that's incredible, he's just multi-talented if it is that Wimbledon. <laughs> And no, not the tennis thing, okay? The Wimbledon oh, Cup is a little bit of play. Wait, wait, wait. He said tennis version. Yeah. <laughs> and no, not the tennis thing, okay? He's the not talking about the tennis. He's the clip is a tennis version. No, I know, but what, why confuse us? <laughs> <laughs> 
and no, not the tennis thing, okay? The Wimbledon Cup is awarded for whoever wins the 1,000-yard high-powered rifle marksmanship competition. And uh. whoever does that is considered to kind of be the best rifle marksman on the planet at that point in time. And in 1965, it was Carlos Hathcock. Pepe. White feather, he's nicknamed. A couple of months later, Carlos mm -hmm. Hathcock, the best marksman on the planet, is on his way to Vietnam. So naturally, the Vietnam. Marine Corps yeah. makes him guard the front gate to a base. No, I'm not kidding. Okay, Wait, because what? you gotta remember, nobody understands what a sniper is at this point in time. Jim Land just created the course for it four years prior, and he none just of won the win tactics win have been cup. battle tested. So presumably, there's like maybe a couple hundred Marines that have passed the scout sniper course running around in the entire Marine Corps. Nobody understands what a sniper is. Nobody understands how to utilize them, when to use them, and what they're doing. So... Yeah. When they're trying to figure out how, where to send Hathcock over in Vietnam, all gate. they see is that he's an O331 machine gunner that has not been attached to an infantry unit and has not been training with a machine gun for the past five years, so they don't feel comfortable sending him into combat, so they just have him oh, guard the, the front gate. Mode. I mean, I guess to be fair, it's probably the safest front gate in Vietnam. No bad guys getting within <laughs> a thousand yards of it. And yeah. this goes on for the first four months that Carlos is in four Vietnam. Months. Him okay. being assigned as an MP guarding the front gate to a base. Carlos Hathcock absolutely hates it the entire time. Okay, but then Jim Land mm -hmm. gets deployed to Vietnam and he has permission to round up a bunch of other scout snipers that have already went through okay. this program over the course of the last five years. And he gets to pull them aside into their own scout sniper platoon where they get to experiment, test, and refine all the methods that he has been teaching for the last five years. And obviously the first Which person cool. on his but like Vietnam War was, was like a really hard war. Imagine for snipers, it'd be a nightmare because they're all mm. hidden in the trees and yeah. stuff like that. Um, and like I say, I guess it's more close combat. I feel like that's such a hard war for it. I don't, I don't know too much about it, but we'll find List out. to grab up is his very first star pupil and gate guard, Carlos Hathcock. Thank you! <laughs> so they get this platoon of scout snipers together. They go out to what's going to be their new headquarters for the rest of the deployment. It's right outside of Da Nang called Hill 55. And right out of the gate, this entire operation is a good old fashioned military shit show, right? Because there hasn't been snipers in the Marine Corps since the Korean War. There's no doctrine. Okay. There's no instructions. There's no, here's how we operate. Here's what we do. They have to figure all that out and just wing it. And if that wasn't bad enough, Fair because enough. there hasn't yeah. been snipers in the Marine Corps since the Korean War, they don't have any sniper rifles in the Marine Corps. So they oh. don't even have guns. They're just oh. out there being snipers with M1 Grands and iron yeah, that's sights. Not great. Obviously that's not gonna work. So Jim Land just ends up getting a bunch of civilian hunting rifles with scopes sent wow. over to Vietnam and giving those to the Dude, men. And Carlos Hathcock ends up with a Winchester Model 70 chambered in 30-06 with an 8X scope. Land also somehow manages to get his guys match grade ammunition, which is like a higher quality, more accurate ammunition that you're gonna want if you're shooting at long ranges from there okay. they get the operation underway they go out they start conducting missions they start developing the doctrine figuring out what works and what rifle. doesn't laying the groundwork well, the for what is going to become modern Camouflage. sniping in the united yeah, states no, military. No, and then the oh, they, they, chimes they, in with brilliant um, ideas still not really understanding what these guys are trying to do and they're just like oh hey well since you're like experimenting and you know developing stuff or whatever over on hill 55 what if we just start sending you new guys that haven't done the scout sniper program <laughs> previously and also good. aren't professional marksmen and then you can just you know train them how to be scout snipers in a live combat zone on the fly Sounds for like funsies chaos. does that sound good for Why you don't you do really that? care what you think do it anyways k okay, bye that would be great okay Kate, do you understand how absurd that is? It's yeah. like Nikola Tesla in his laboratory unlocking the secrets of alternating current electricity <laughs> and random dudes like Steve and Kevin just keep showing up to the door with orders of like, hi, I'm supposed to get trained in the electricity stuff. Like I'm still working <laughs> on unlocking the secrets and figuring it out. I'll let you know when I'm done. Yeah, nope, yeah. can't do that. You got to teach me everything you know right now on the spot live. Let's go. So we've got the pioneers, the new guys, minute. training the even newer guys as this goes along. So where's the office back at division? in office baby according to jim land carlos oh, hathcock was actually one of if not the best instructors he had not only was he exceptional at instructing zone. people yeah. how to shoot because that's been his job the entire time he's been in the marine corps but he also was very good at taking guys out on real life missions and putting their mental ability to the test because he didn't really care how well you shot he cared about how well you shot after laying in the prone position for two days the exactly. mental game was the Patience. biggest factor in determining if somebody was cut out to be a sniper or if they weren't and carlos was extremely gifted at finding that out very quickly. Okay. In addition to teaching, Carlos is going out on absolutely Could you do that? Could you lay in a prone spot for two hours? Well, two days? 
No. Nah, not for an hour. You've got to be, you've you've got your snacks minutes. up here, but if you want your results as a sniper, you've got to be patient. Yeah, you know what true. I mean? You've got to be sneaky and patient. Mission he can. He ends up becoming good friends with another sniper by the name of John Roland Burke, and he prefers okay. to go out with him or Jim Land himself end up being the two guys that he goes out on missions with the most. Makes and sense. Hathcock preferred the them because they were also exceptional scouts, which is what was most important to him because Hathcock preferred to get within a hundred yards of an enemy before taking a shot, just so it was a sure thing. And a lot Makes of the sense. other new guys yeah. were good at moving quietly rifle. through the jungle, yeah. and that prevented Hathcock from being able to do that. So, if John Roland Burke and Jim Land weren't available, Hathcock would just go out by himself. And this is one of those That's parts dangerous. I mentioned previously where people like to start casting doubt and criticism upon this story, like... Buh, he must be lying because snipers always go out in pairs. They never go out by themselves. But okay, I would agree with that if I didn't have the context that the sniper that we're talking about was one of the very first modern Marine Corps scout snipers in U.S. history that yeah. was actively in the process of developing the doctrine that's going to shape that career field for the rest of fucking forever. Yeah. So yeah, normally okay. you can write, however, yeah. historical context is a thing and it's kind of important. Okay, moving on. So Carlos Hathcock <laughs> and the rest of the entire scout sniper He's platoon start racking up and un unprecedented amount of kills because they fight different than the rest of the military, right? The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army, they run into Americans. They're like, oh, they're a thousand yards away. They're 800 yards away. We're fine. And normally Ooh, they are fine, anymore. except for when they run into these guys, then they have the, a mind blowing issue. So Jim Land is sending up reports like, hey, my platoon has 14 confirmed kills this week. And the chain of command is like, what? Whoa, hold on. That's like more confirmed kills than an entire infantry battalion is getting at this That's point impressive. in time. You got that from one platoon sized element. That's not even possible. What What is going on over there? So he kind of explains how they're operating, what they're testing. You know, they've got a couple dudes that are doing one man operations. They're doing some two man operations. They're experimenting with three man operations. And the higher ups in the chain of command are like, I, I don't believe you. You know, these, <laughs> these two or three or one guys could just be lying and having a gentleman's agreement to pad their stats. True. I'm not going to trust mm -hmm. this. The only way that we're going to recognize confirmed kills from this unit is if a commanding officer themselves witnesses it, which okay. is absolutely an insane criteria, how right? Especially how with how all of that? Well, I, I'm guessing they tell him to come along with them, I guess, but I don't know. I, I guess I've got to tell him to come along, but I suppose it is one of them. Snipers are very... They don't know much about them. They don't even know what a sniper is. Never been tested before. If suddenly you're beating everyone else on the field, it's like, are you sure you're not just booking Yeah, BSing I feel like, something? yeah, having to send, at least you know if they go, it's... It confirms it. It does seem like it's a harsh criteria. It's almost criteria. like this generation's picks where it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. It is a prove, prove it. it happened. Because how do you actually prove it happened, you know? Yeah witnesses it which is absolutely an insane criteria right especially with how a sniper operates because now the only way that you're going to be able to get a confirmed kill is if jim land or another officer goes out on a mission with you or if you're up on the hill performing overwatch duty and there's an officer down? also performing overwatch duty down? with yeah. you which actually ends up being how most of these guys got their confirmed kills and all the kills they got when they went out on missions didn't actually count wow. because obviously they weren't always able to take an officer out on a sniper mission with them yeah. so those kills were never able to be confirmed and weren't counted so it's okay. kind of a silly okay. standard but carlos didn't care at all he didn't care about the stats he didn't care about the glory even later in life when he was asked in interviews how many kills he thought he had he genuinely had no idea he could estimate a rough range and that was about it hathcock didn't take pride in killing the enemy he took pride in the fact that he was the one being put in the dangerous situations in the first place oh, because he yeah. truly really believed that he was the best man for the job and if he he didn't go awesome. they were going to send someone else out and if that person got hurt because they weren't as good as he was that was going to be on him because wow. of this carlos was going on every mindset. single mission that he possibly could according to jim land it was impossible to keep carlos from going out it was okay. even tougher to reel him back in that's different gravy in it that is different yeah, gravy i feel like it's different gravy anyway to be like doing it doing but it like but that is like different different gravy insane. <laughs> <laughs> the man was harder than insane gravy yeah. because of this hathcock starts racking up a ton of kills some of them are confirmed when he's going out with jim land some of them are confirmed when he's on hill 55 and a ton of them aren't confirmed when he's going out by himself or with john burke however carlos genuinely doesn't care he's just going to work Somewhere yeah. early on in this process, he stumbles across a white feather. He's not exactly sure what kind of bird it came from, but he thinks it probably came from a chicken. So he picks it up, sticks it in his boonie cap, and he white leaves it there for the rest of the time he's in Vietnam. Okay, that's absolutely...
absolutely crazy for a sniper to do. White is not a very common True. color inside the not jungles of Vietnam, no. and having that color on him is going to stick out like a sore thumb while he's trying to wear his camouflage and everything else and go unnoticed. And when he was asked why he did it, he said he was basically taunting the enemy, like, here I am come get me. He was rubbing it in their face <laughs> wow. that he was the best and he knew it. Now Insane on one hand, gravy. I feel like yeah. this seems incredibly reckless and uncharacteristically arrogant for him. But on the other hand, I think he did it on purpose and it lines up with his code of ethics perfectly. I think he did this on purpose to protect the guy that went out with him, whether that was okay. Jim Land or John Burke or anybody else, because he got them in the situation where he took them out on this incredibly dangerous mission that he volunteered for because he was the best. And I yep. think he felt that if another enemy sniper or an enemy spotted them first, oh, that feather him. would mean that they saw him first and shot him and wow. gave his partner a chance to get away. I think the wow. single That's quality impressive. that separates a boy from a man is when you make somebody else's <laughs> well-being your personal responsibility. Carlos Definitely. Hathcock wasn't just a man, he was the man, because he made absolutely everyone's well-being his personal responsibility. That's big, yeah. isn't it? Fair play. Elephant? As time passes okay. and Carlos continues to rack up more and more kills, the enemy becomes more and more aware that there's a hotshot sniper out there always wearing a white feather, and they start calling him the Long reputation. Ken, White Feather. And as Carlos's reputation grows both with the enemy, the scout sniper platoon, and his chain of command, so does his experience. Oh, and with a long that experience, time. he starts to... That white feather in, in Vietnam. I would guess. I... I've never spoke a bit of me, but I would make sense. Mm. Let us know in the comments below. Develop his doctrine, his standards, his operating procedures, and how he does things. He now realizes that he for sure operates best in a pair, and his number one right-hand man is John Burke, that he wants out there with him on okay. every single mission possible. He also figures out that the best way to go out onto a mission is not to be inserted by helicopter with his pair, but to link up with another local infantry unit and go out with their entire platoon, and then him and his spotter will peel off from that platoon, and then go out on their one, two, three, four, five, six day mission by themselves. But that six is the best mission. way to be inserted and go unnoticed. He okay. also creates a rule that a sniper fires from a position three times, no more, and then he moves to another position. But on one occasion, he would violate that rule. At Ooh, first, it wasn't any different okay. from what had become his new norm for a mission. Him and John Burke linked up with a different infantry company, went out with a platoon sized element on their patrol. And at some random point that they picked themselves, they peeled off and went off just the two of them to go do their sniper thing. Okay. And while they're going out, they had planned to go out and stock for six days. They brought just enough food and just enough water for that. That's a long and that's time. It. Right. Hathcock always packed light. He only brought whatever he could fit in his pockets. He never went out with a rucksack or a bag of any kind. Okay. There are a couple hours six into this patrol days. or this. Six days he worth of food pocket. in his pockets. He ain't eating much. <clears throat> Not me. I'd need just backpack full of biscuits yeah, just rich teas constantly the crunch giving yeah, you away no. i literally if i saw a mcdonald's as well i'd be like sorry yeah. guys shoot me sorry guys i know what i'm getting mcdonald's Maybe chicken comes first dark and they come across this great overlook position overlooking thousands of yards of rice paddies and right down the middle of it there's this levee where there's a ton of water to make it through so they okay. post up right on the wood line with rice paddies then this levee and then more rice paddies on the other side it's perfect because if the enemy is on the other side of that levee they're going to be able to engage the enemy mm, and the enemy is going to have to try to make their way through all that water in the levee and they can just start picking them off one by one or they can use that time to get out of there so that's what they okay. do they get their hide set up and they just start watching and waiting and hours pass and hours pass and finally that evening sure enough the hamburgers show up the cornerstone <laughs> of any nutritious breakfast <laughs> yeah, that's what Carlos Hathcock calls the enemy. According to him, there was only actually one enemy in Vietnam that he was fighting, and his name was Homer Hamburger. I have no fucking <laughs> idea why, but I thought it was funny. So, 150 Homer Hamburgers come dilly-dallying through the rice paddies. These guys are like a thousand yards away on the other side of the levee, but they're coming towards them. So, they keep letting them come closer, come closer, come closer, and right as they're about to get up on the levee, they can really start seeing them. They're about five to 600 yards away, which is perfect distance for Carlos to basically have 100% accuracy. I mean, okay. he's the best shot at 1,000 yards in the world. 500 yards for him it's is a bad. walk it's in not, the park. Yeah. Granted, nothing's actually for sure. It's never 100%. It's definitely not fish in a barrel, but it is quite literally Homer hamburgers <laughs> in a rice paddy, which is close enough. So as this entire company <laughs> comes up to this levee, Hathcock whispers over to John Burke with his M14, hey, you're going to take out the off officer in the front i'm gonna take out the officer in the back so that's what they do they both fire they both take out their officer that they were aiming for i'll okay, fire first play. i want you two to start with the officers and work your way down 
Wow. So now Good there's shots. like 147 Homer hamburgers looking around like, oh shit, what do we do? And the third and final officer takes off running. Believe it or not, it's pretty hard to run in a rice paddy and you can't run very fast, but he also didn't have to run very far, so... At least on the bright side, wow. he didn't die tired. So at this point, oh. Carlos has shot once. Right. John Burke has shot once. That's three shots from one location. They got a bounce. But for some reason, Carlos is like, hold on, let's let's wait a second. Because as he's watching this like 147 dudes, they're just standing there. They don't know what to do. They just bunker down out in the open in the middle of this field. Wow. And don't do anything. So Carlos is like, I mean... I mean, I know we're supposed to move after three, but I guess we can just sit here and pick them off until they do something. Now, if you're an American, Ooh, this sounds weird to us because in the American military, if you take out the officer, like, congratulations, you've just taken the regulator off the ass whooping machine. Now you've got a bunch of pissed off grunts that are looking to get creative and you're about to find out the hard way. It's never a war crime the first time. But in a bunch of other militaries, especially historically, the further we go back in time, they aren't trained to improvise and win anyways. They're trained to hunker down and await for further orders before they do anything. Oh, okay. That's okay. what these guys are doing. And apparently these guys didn't have a radio with them because the orders never came because they just kept sitting there and Carlos just kept picking them off I mean, one after one after one. In his own words, every time one of them would peek up their head, they'd lose their haircut. Now at this point, Carlos <laughs> considers calling in artillery because he does have a radio and he does have artillery waiting on standby, but he thinks that that's gonna play into their favor because if he fires artillery, they're in a rice paddy. So those artillery shells are gonna be landing <laughs> into the water of the rice paddy, drastically decreasing their effectiveness. True. And then as soon as the first shell lands, all the guys can call, you know, incoming, dive into the water of the rice paddy, ride out the volley, get up, run. They do that two or three times, they're home free. So Makes he's sense. just gonna yeah. keep them pinned down and he does it they all day long until nightfall. So when the sun goes down, Carlos finally calls in for artillery, but it's not normal artillery. He calls in for star clusters and just lights up the sky over this rice paddy so that he can see what's going on and keep them pinned down oh, all wow. night long. Once it became not apparent that they understood that they were going to be pinned down all night long, Carlos and John Burke took this opportunity to move to a different location. Next morning, first light, the hamburgers have mustered up the courage and come up with a plan that they are going to try to directly assault Carlos Hathcock or at least his general direction wow. by running through but a levee and about five to six hundred yards yeah, of rice paddies. Yeah, that's what I think he's at, Surely they? some of them will make it there. Yeah, that plan didn't last very long. They decided that was a horrible plan right around the time Carlos and John had to reload. So they hunker back down pretty much in the same exact spot, not knowing what to do. They just start like randomly firing at where they think Carlos and John are from 600 yards away with their AK-47. So it's not very effective fire, yeah. even if they were shooting where Carlos and John were, but they're not because they're shooting at their old spot that they mm. had yesterday. From yeah. here, Carlos just goes back to keeping them pinned down, just playing whack-a-homer. Every time one pops up, they lose their haircut. They know that <laughs> they can't move and they're stuck there. And Carlos is perfectly content with just letting them sit there and bake in the sun all day long because the more dehydrated and tired mm -hmm. they get, the less likely it's gonna be that they're gonna- And waste He's miniature. basically turned yeah. this into his very own miniature war of attrition. Night comes, they light up the sky again all night long, keeps them pinned down. The next day, same exact thing happens, keeps them pinned down. Oh, night comes days. again, light it up all night long. Every day these guys are baking in the sun and every night John Burke is radioing back to the artillery, getting them more and more dialed in. And this goes on for five days straight. And by the end of the fifth day, Carlos That's and John mad. are about out of water. Time. They're completely out of food. They're both tired. They haven't slept much. Carlos figures these guys are as tired as they're absolutely going to get. They're not going to be able to run very fast through this rice paddy. They're definitely not making it through that levee to get me in time if I try to slip away. And on top of that, the artillery boys should have this pretty well dialed in. So he calls in artillery and they level the entire rice paddy as him and John make their way back to Hill 55. Wow. Wow. Five days as well. I say, because they're doing mm. it all night. They probably have only had one or two hours sleep. Max. Yeah. Just, also, I'd be, I'd be booking someone coming from behind me, though. Yeah, I'd be so scared. But fair play, man. Absolute animal. <laughs> Absolute animals. So at this Cobra. point, Carlos and the entire scout sniper experiment on Hill 55 is proving to be extremely effective and word is spreading throughout the Marine Corps in the local military operating area and they have gotten the nickname Murder Inc. So some <laughs> press officer in a stroke of genius, I assume, says to himself, wow, there's this new experimental type of unit being extremely successful by being sneaky and unseen and the enemy doesn't know about them. 
Yeah. I should write a newspaper article about them to let everybody back home know how effective these guys are. So okay. now Jim Land, Carlos, That's and the rest of Hill Five are all pissed off. You know, nothing a sniper enjoys more than when you shine a fucking spotlight on it. Mainly, Ho Chi Minh puts a bounty on both Jim Land and Carlos Hathcock's head and sends his very best sniper to go collect those bounties. Okay. Yeah, I guess you all go in, oh, who we, we got? I'm going, oh. That's the guys who were shooting mm. at us. Get them, yeah. Maybe it isn't a good idea. Yeah, I don't think so. Wait till after the war. <laughs> guy by the name of Cobra. But Carlos doesn't know that for sure. That's just the word on the street until one day there's a young Marine staff sergeant passing by Carlos's tent and he stops to have a conversation with somebody right by the door of Carlos's tent and he gets shot by an enemy sniper. Carlos runs out of the tent, sees what happened. He immediately puts together this enemy sniper's probably been watching him for days and he knew that that was oh, Carlos's tent after. and he saw oh, that the MCO was about the same size, same build as him. The enemy sniper thought that he'd just killed Whitefeather. And Carlos Hathcock is absolutely furious. He grabs his rifle, he grabs John Burke, and they head off in the direction that that shot came from, looking for this enemy sniper. They're proceeding with caution, looking for an enemy sniper, stalking their way up there the entire time. So it takes a long time, but they yeah, finally yeah. work their mm -hmm. way down over to the next hill and start working their way up, and they end up finding this sniper's hide. As they're climbing this hill, it started to level out a little bit, and then it dipped back down into this tiny little creek waterway, and then it started going right back up. The creek wasn't even visible unless you were literally right on top of it. It okay. was the perfect spot for a sniper to be. Anyway. And the little tiny creek was perfect to slip down into and make a perfect clean covered getaway and go completely unnoticed. So Carlos goes, you know, that's exactly what I would do. So he starts following this waterway to see where it leads and they're following it and they're following it. And sure enough, they come up and on the other side of this little waterway is the biggest, muddiest, most intentional looking footprints on the fucking planet. Mm. Carlos immediately knows that if he follows looking. those footprints, he is going to be walking face first into a trap because that sniper realizes that he had just fired upon an entire hilltop full of snipers and surely one of them is going to come after him after he had just small. killed the mm -hmm. infamous white feather I so what, what this sniper is very small yeah Carlos is smarter, but uh, yeah. it's a shame he's against Carlos, I guess, but he's a smart dude, yeah. this sniper, Cobra. Who's on the other side of those footprints is handcrafted by a sniper to kill another sniper. Carlos is looking at the footprints, weighing his options. He could call in artillery and just level the entire side of the mountain from there on out, but that wouldn't be a guarantee and he True. needs to make sure because this guy is too dangerous. The yeah. problem is, is this hasn't really been done before, okay? This sniper platoon that's experimental and is paving the way for sniper warfare hasn't run into this issue where they have to go toe to toe with a near peer and they have the upper hand. Carlos peer. is kind of nervous. This mm -hmm. sniper is good. He's done everything the exact same way that Carlos would have done it. Later in his life, he was interviewed about this and the interviewer asked him if he was scared to which Carlos replied, I was never scared. But at this point, I was very, very alert. At this mm. point, Carlos okay. says, this guy's good, but he's not better than me. There's no way. He then proceeds to don his plot armor and him and John plot Burke walk armor. face first that. into a trap. So they're following this guy's oh, trail. Oh, it's they went so into obvious it. it's got to be intentional. And they come up onto this clearing and off in the distance, they see the most obvious tiny little one man campsite on the face of the planet. There's no way a sniper this good is being this obvious. So Carlos is just frozen, trying to figure out what is going on and what this guy's thinking so that he can counter it. He's trying to be one step of the enemy, knowing that the enemy is already one step ahead of him. Yeah. So he just asks himself, what would he be doing in this hard. situation? Yeah. He comes to the conclusion that the enemy sniper is probably expecting whoever's following him to come up onto that campsite to investigate, meaning that that enemy sniper has a hide somewhere with a perfect shot directly at that campsite. So okay. Carlos reevaluates everything, deciding where he would pick the perfect shot if he had had to shoot at somebody at that little campsite and he finds it. So Carlos and John Ooh, start to move out and around so that they can get a perfect shot at where they think this sniper is going to be set up. It takes them a while. They're proceeding with a lot of caution. They're moving super slow, but they end up making it there and they start scanning the entire area where they think that enemy sniper might be, looking for a very well concealed enemy. John yeah, Burke using his binoculars and yeah, Carlos using the scope. But he's probably on his really rifle. good they're really scanning. Well hidden as well because he and knows they were going to follow the trap. Exactly, and also he's in his own country, so he knows the terrain as well, which is easy to hide in, I guess. They're scanning, they're looking for this guy, and time passes, time passes, they keep looking, they keep looking, and suddenly there's a gunshot, and Carlos's heart falls into his stomach. Time stops. He doesn't know if he's hit, or worse, if John got hit, and maybe his overconfidence walking face first into a trap just got his best friend. Okay, so now he was John scared. Burke says the last thing that Carlos ever wanted to hear, I'm hit. And as he says that, Carlos feels warm liquid hitting up against his leg from John Burke's direction. As he looks down, 
and sees water soaking into his pants. And he looks over. John Burke's canteen had just gotten shot off of his hip. Oh. And John was fine. Carlos, what? absolutely relieved, tells John Burke, it's just your canteen. Get up. We got to go. They break contact. Wow. Then they re-enter their stock. The only way out of this now is to kill him first. And they don't know where he's at. Hopefully... He doesn't know where they're at either, but they do kind of know where that initial shot came from. So they start making their way there through this irregular route, stalking along the way, trying to find this guy. And they're stalking, they're stalking. It takes them forever, but they finally That's get to so this guy. That's so lucky, by the way. I was like, oh, the canteen. Oh, On the hip. Could have been the hip bone. Oh, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. You ain't walking out there alive. You're on the floor. I can actually feel it myself. It's making me cringe in my head. Yeah. To be fair, as that, we are at 39 minutes. So we'll end part one here. Um, literally going to see what happens in tents. They've survived so far. <coughs> we know he survives. Just hopefully yeah. everyone Where's survives. Where's the next 20 minutes of their voice time? No, it's not because we're going to find out what happens and stuff like that. And like oh, say, no, we know Carlos survives. We know Carlos. It's only Carlos we know survives. Mm. So um, I'm guessing he gets in, but is there any casualties? What happens? And we've got to learn all his other stories. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, it's good so far. We're going to crack on with it straight away now. It's going to be out in about three hours' time. So if you're enjoying it, smash that like button, guys. Smash that subscribe button. Part two in the description right now. Well, after three hours in the description. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Have a great... Have a fantastic day. Have a fantastic day. Peace. <laughs>